Hi everyone, welcome to our seventh event in the Alumni Spotlight series, where we shine a light on the expertise and passion among our great alumni community. My name's Ben Mumby Croft. You maybe saw a photo of me in the slides at the start, slightly more hair. Uh, that was pre-COVID. Uh, and my role is I'm Director of Entrepreneurship at Imperial College London. So I have the amazing job of working with our incredible students, staff and alumni community, helping people to variously identify, explore new ideas and hopefully sort of raise investment for those and create successful or create and scale successful companies. Um, today, we are joined by alumni from over 16 countries from across five college faculties. Uh, we're pleased to have you with us. Today's talk, we are speaking with alumni entrepreneurs, so I'm interested to get a sense of where you're all at in terms of your entrepreneurial journey. So we're going to open a quick poll with like, I think, four or five really simple questions. So feel free to complete that poll whilst I run through the, um, the intro. For the next hour or so, we'll have the pleasure of hearing from two exceptional alumni or, um, and who were deserving winners of our recent Alumni Entrepreneur Awards. Awards. Both Divya and Tassos have been have had fascinating careers since graduating from Imperial and a true credit to our community. Uh, and I'm really looking forward to hearing their stories. So first of all, let me introduce our two fantastic speakers. So first up, Dr. Tassos Kanudis, who was a PhD in electrical and electronic engineering, uh, 2000, a great year by all accounts. Uh, Tassos founded Signal Generics, one of the first R&D companies or R&D technology companies in Cyprus in 2004 and has been contributing to the transformation of the Cypriot economy ever since. A country once best known for tourism is now attracting technology companies from all over the world and Tassos is the proud and illustrious winner of the 2022 Alumni Entrepreneur Award. Welcome Tassos. Second up is Divya Gupta, MSc Management 2013, another incredible year by all accounts. Um, Divya is the co-founder and CEO of Mumsjoy.com, India's leading maternity and nursing fashion wear brand. Self-funded and sustainable, uh, not to be sniffed at for any startup founders out there. Uh, Mumsjoy is profitable and selling over 1,200 unique products within four years of its launch. But Divya is only just getting started with a venture into the world of fashion and e-commerce. And Divya was highly commended in the Alumni Entrepreneur Award in 2021. Tassos and Divya, welcome to the seventh Alumni Spotlight Series. And by all accounts, I, I think that this is going to be the best Alumni Spotlight Series so far. I'll just, um, before we get into the questions, I'll just reveal the results of the poll. Um, so in terms of where are people at in their entrepreneurial journey, so 28% uh, of people on today's call thinking about starting a business in the next six months, 6% uh, have just started up, 11% uh, have been running their own business for a number of years and looking at ways to scale up, uh, no percent looking to sell an existing business, and 56% 56, 56 are other, um, and we'll read into that what you will. Uh, so to, to kick things off, Tassos, can you start by sharing how you started on your entrepreneurial journey so from graduating from imperial to where you are today on this sort of webinar can you tell us a little bit more about what got you started into the world of entrepreneurship uh, hello ben uh, i would like to thank you and uh, imperial alumni for uh, setting up this event and also the people that are attending I was I studied for my PhD in electrical electronics engineering back in in between ninety seven and two thousand. Uh, then I spent one uh, year as a postdoc and worked in the high tech industry in the UK before returning in Cyprus in two thousand and four, and establishing Signal and Generics as one of the first uh, R and D companies. Um, after eighteen years, uh, we see Signal and Generics to export its. Uh, products in uh, more than 28 countries uh, across the world and also recently uh, being listed the, um, uh, by Deloitte in the uh, 50 fast uh, growing uh, technology companies in the region of Middle East. Uh, after uh, I set up uh, Signal Genetics when I was 30, so I already had uh, enough experience from academia and industry and uh, I knew what I wanted uh, to do. 
Uh, so we established Sigla Genetics because we wanted, uh, because there was no any company to be able to work in R&D in, in Cyprus back then. Um, and uh, with the vision to, uh, and the goal to have a company that we feel mentally and scientifically challenged uh, every day. And I think we achieved that. Excellent. And Divya, same question to you. So how did you start on your entrepreneurial journey? So what, what happened from graduating from Imperial to, to being here today? Uh, hi, everyone. Um, so after completing my master's in management from Imperial, I joined my family business uh, to acquire certain skills. Uh, I always wanted to be an entrepreneur, but uh, the idea was just not clicking in. Uh, and it's in 2015 when my childhood friend, Kriti Baveja, and I uh, decided to launch Mom's Joy. And that happened when we met a common friend who expressed anguish on being unable to find the right clothes that could fit during pregnancy. And that really gave us a blow. Uh, so she used to stay at home, uh, which was you know, very shocking for us. And that's when we realized that pregnancy is so underrated in India and needed much more importance. So we decided to take the plunge and launch our own uh, maternity and nursing fashion wear brand. And it has been a tremendous ride since then. Uh, we broke even within the first year. Um, as uh, Ben mentioned, we are uh, sustainable, self-funded and profitable. Uh, we have a so strong social media community of over 100,000 engaged mothers uh, with clients of, again, 100,000 uh, happy moms. Uh, we've styled many celebrities and um, um, I, was a, I was a TEDx speaker and uh, a brand uh, was awarded the best maternity wear brand in India for four years in a row. So it comes with its own set of challenges, uh, but it's been a, a eventful journey. That's a great, and, and you've set me up nicely for the next question. So Tassas, I'm gonna come back to you. So what, in terms of, so to starting up something, it's coming up with an idea, it's kind of, I think there's an opportunity, I'm gonna start a business here. What have been the key challenges from your point of view? What were the things that you, or the unexpected challenges, what was really difficult in those early stages to go from having the idea to actually having something that was viable and sustainable? Uh, is that for me? Sorry, to, I'm going to go to Tassos and then come back to you, Divya. Okay. Uh, first of all, the first challenge uh, is to set up a highly caliber team because you are going to carry and you are going to be dependent on that team throughout the years. So we achieved that uh, uh, hiring also many uh, Imperial College graduates. Uh, then when, if you are innovating and you are entering a, a new industry or you're creating a new industry, you have to overcome bureaucracy, ignorance, uh, and bringing uh, change in this environment. So it needs a lot of hard work. Um, also, you have to overcome the financial challenges. Uh, we are 18 years old company and we've been through financial crisis, through deposit haircuts, through COVID, you can name it. So you have to be flexible and be able to overcome all these challenges. And uh, one uh, challenge which is very important is uh, throughout these difficulties uh, to establish and maintain um, uh, an environment where people uh, feel uh, uh, motivated and happy. Absolutely. And Divya, so same question to you, and, and particularly given that, you know, this is this is e-commerce, right? This is business to consumer. So, so you're like, okay, here's an opportunity. This isn't happening. We need to start something here. But what were the real challenges in actually getting that off the ground and building it to where it is now? Uh, so when we launched, we were very excited. Um, but there were a lot of challenges, like uh, both my partner and I are computer engineers, and we have no design background. Uh, so we could not translate the designs that were in our head. And when we actually made the samples, they were awful. And I thought we could never do this. Um, but fast forward, uh, we are awarded for the best design now. And Oops, sorry, I've lost you there a little bit. Uh, also, when we launched, we had no money. Uh, yes, so we had no money when we launched because I never had any savings. Um, and uh, but that led us to thinking of innovative ideas and using a lot of free services, uh, because of which we launched in uh, you know less than twenty five percent of our budget. 
um, and uh, one challenge that took me by surprise was that people never took us seriously. They thought they are girls out of school. It's just a hobby for them. And gender bias, which I'd never faced in my life, actually came into play. And, uh, you know, our vendors, mostly male-dominated uh, society, they across the table and negotiate with us. Um, so uh, a challenge, but uh, uh, we were aware of it, but never took it on our mind. And when real things happen, things really change and we preferred vendors and the only vendor in COVID times. Wow. Okay. And what was the, how did you overcome, I mean, you mentioned the sort of the gender bias there. How did you get around that? What did you do to overcome that? Because like that potentially could have like stopped you, if you're not being taken seriously, that can stop you right there. So how did you overcome that? I think I have this power of uh, being aware and not being emotionally attached to it. So I don't waste a lot of time on it. And I knew that, you know, once things happen, they'll see the difference. Um, so it didn't take much time and we continued to, uh, you know, get to them, negotiate no matter what. And when we actually placed orders and then placed repeat orders, so things are very different. Absolutely, 100 percent. Absolutely. And Tassos, coming back to you. So obviously we've recently been through a sort of global pandemic. So what was the impact of COVID on your work or business? Uh, of course, we were, no, but we were not prepared as uh, everyone. <laughs> and uh, since we are active in the electronics industry, we were uh, significantly affected uh, because of uh, the um, unavailability of electronic components, uh, the sudden increase in uh, electronic components, but also uh, not being able uh, during the lockdowns to access our facilities, our production. Uh, but uh, we turn this to positive because uh, we diverted our technologies to tackle uh, uh, COVID effects and we secure two uh, large contracts. Uh, we learned how to reuse electronics. So we have now a huge stock of electronic components. Uh, um, and we also, most importantly, we use, uh, we understood that uh, we can work uh, uh, remotely. So we were on one of the first companies in Cyprus to establish uh, hybrid uh, uh, um, working uh, schemes. So, and this turned back uh, very positively to our company because we achieved more people satisfaction and also we had the opportunity to uh, hire uh, uh, talent uh, from a greater geographical uh, uh, region than uh, our hometown. Um, so this is more or less our experience from COVID. And is that, do you see, do you see those like innovations and changes sticking or do you see, or, or now that we're going back more to how things were, do you, do you see, is it, are things going back to how they were or what are the kind of key changes that you see remaining in place? Uh, this goes to me? Yes, sorry. Ah, okay. Uh, um, I don't think that, um, uh, I think that nothing is going back exactly to where we are and mainly as far as the working conditions is concerned. So yeah. now we understood that uh, we can work uh, efficiently uh, remotely. So we established, we invested a lot in the company, so as to establish the appropriate infrastructure to be able to work uh, remotely. Um, so there will be uh, a shift, I think, uh, and we already see it uh, here in Cyprus of uh, flexible working schemes, okay. even for the industry. Yeah, it's really interesting. So certainly a lesson for us at Imperial just in terms of having to run things online overnight. Uh, my wife's company, the same as you, started hiring people that they never would have hired normally yeah. because there's more of a sort of geographical distribution. Divya, what was the impact? So what was what was your kind of COVID experience and what were the challenges being sort of CEO and founder of Mum's Joy? Uh, so initially, uh, first month uh, when the COVID uh, hit, our production was shut off and uh, um, you know everything was shut. So that was very difficult. Um, but then uh, we had to find a way around it. And uh, like um, Tassos, we also just turned it into our uh, positive. Uh, so uh, we got to know that essentials category could be shipped. So overnight, we uh, tied up with vendors and added baby essential products, which we'd never done. And um, then uh, we applied to the government of India uh, for shipping permission. And we were lucky to get that. 
and we also asked them to put maternity into essential category, which was not the case. So we submitted our customer requests and then we got um, permission to ship um, under essential category. Uh, so, and uh, our products were sold out uh, within days. It was, uh, uh, you know, that month was the best selling month, the highest revenue. Um, but, uh, you know, sending out the orders because production facility was closed was a challenge. And then we worked out our logistics and uh, virtual uh, setup and everything worked. And then we created stock that did not need manufacturing. Uh, so a lot of innovative ideas came up and uh, it, it turned out to be a best selling uh, time. It's been a really interesting time being in innovation entrepreneurship. It's a sort of, um, what was it? Necessity is the mother of all invention. And it absolutely, when suddenly you hit a constraint, that's when you kind of see sort of innovation come to its kind of form. In terms of, so Tassos, coming back to you now. So, I mean, certainly in terms of my role, we, we talk a lot about the importance you know, of, of the startup phase of the business of getting something off the ground. I mean, you're in a sort of privileged position. You've been running your company for you know many years now. Um, from your point of view, what have been the key challenges? So not so we move moving beyond the start. What have been the key challenges in terms of growing a company or scaling a company? Um, I think that the biggest challenge is uh, the mentality of the owners, of the entrepreneurs. Uh, scaling up uh, means uh, uh, losing some control, <laughs> uh, delegating. So because I've seen as a company, we also have uh, spin outs, we have startups, uh, we are helping people creating their own startups. So we are, uh, we are I'm involved in uh, all the phases of uh, a startup company. So I think the biggest challenge of scaling up is uh, the mentality of the, of the owners. Um, uh, you have to scale up when you are ready to lose some of contr control and uh, to delegate. And uh, this is, I think, his biggest challenge that's finding the money to scale up. And Tassos, just following up on that. So it's so how do you give up control? Because it's one of, oh, yeah, of course, I want to grow and I'm going to have to give up control. Easy to say, difficult to do. So how do you how did you give up control? Um, uh, it's, <laughs> it's, it's not straightforward. Uh, it's <laughs> about the team. It's about growing the team in order to... Um, to get uh, the appropriate people to execute the jobs. But if you are growing and have investors, then you have to be ready to co cooperate with these investors, to bring new people, to go mm -hmm. to, to scale up, uh, let's say, to expand to different countries, to different markets. Uh, so uh, you don't. that's why you don't scale up immediately. So you need to uh, uh, face some years in order to mature the company at the level that you are ready to scale up. To establish a firm foundation Divya, same question to you so what have you in terms of what have the challenges been not necessarily in getting started and obviously lots of challenges in getting started but in terms of like keeping the company successful and scaling the company uh, so now ben we're at this uh, peak where we want to scale up and we're facing this challenge ourselves um, <laughs> um, the major challenge is when you grow your expenses also grow and the margins start to reduce uh, so maintaining a positive cash flow uh, staying cash rich and the question between raising funds versus profitability, losing control to investors. So that is one challenge. And the other is uh, staying relevant and innovative to your customers. Uh, how do you, you know, be on your toes and keep giving them stuff that they're excited about every day? So that is uh, important. And this, I mean, so I'm interested because obviously it almost sounds like you've been profitable and sustainable from day one. So does that present its own challenges when you start to think, well, hang on a minute, if we want to grow, then potentially we need to take on investment. But <clears throat> we never needed investment. So is that like, does that kind of limit your thinking or how do you manage that kind of tension? So I've been struggling with that. And uh, so when you look for investment, then uh, you have to give your 24 hours uh, and work according to somebody else. Uh, also, when you are earning money, then you need to allocate a certain percentage for growth, a certain percentage you want to take as stakeholders, a certain percentage you want to allocate as emergency funds, especially after, you know, learnings from COVID. Uh, so how much to do what and how much to put back into the business, all this is uh, challenging. Um, next question from me. What... Um... What's, so so we work with lots of teams in the very early sort of stages of development and, and a key thing or maybe a key 
trigger early on is, is the relationship between founders. So just based on like just your like either your direct experience or working with other entrepreneurs, what are the kind of uh, what's your advice to to founders about how they make their sort of co-founding relationships rock solid or how they manage arguments or, you know, kind of disagreements within a kind of co-founding relationship? Because it could be quite an intense relationship and it could be quite high stress. So Tassos, to you first. Uh, this is a very good question, actually, because uh, I'm one of the two co-founders of Sigla Genetics. Uh, and um, first of all, you have to be honest. Uh, it doesn't matter if you disagree uh, with your co-founder and always transparent. Uh, running a business means that you're taking uh, thousands of uh, decisions uh, from day-to-day -day, uh, business decisions to strategic decisions. So it's very important to share with your co-founder the same passion uh, and vision for the company. And this is uh, uh, the foundation of uh, long-term uh, success. And Divya, same question to you. Uh, so Tachud, I think I am a champ at this. Okay. Uh, so I think basically you need to have respect and love for your co-founder firstly. And most of the fights um, and breakdowns are because of money. So that should be clear that uh, motivation should not be money, it should be a high purpose. And um, a very simple rule that I follow is that give credit to others and take blame on yourself. Uh, so no you know, fight for credibility, for uh, appreciation. And um, a simple rule that both my co-founder and I follow is that we always address each other as we. Okay, we took this decision and this happened instead of saying you took or I took. So. It's the company that decided something. So even if things go wrong, we don't blame each other. It's so really, that yeah, it's really interesting, isn't it? Because there is a tendency to kind of go, well, my team or I did this or you did that. So it's just a slight tweak of language is kind of key in that sense also, of like, no, we're in this together. Yeah. One more thing is not counting the number of hours the other person is putting in. Uh, especially as women, we are, uh, you know, busy with other things, uh, with family, kids. Um, so, you know, not counting the number of hours and understanding that, you know, this person needs time off. So it's fine. Like when I was expecting my co-founder took care of the company and now she just delivered a baby. So I am the in charge. So you need to have that kind of comfort. Absolutely. And Tessa, this is coming back to you. So what do you, what do you attribute, what are the most important skills or assets that you kind of attribute to your success so far? Uh, I think that uh, uh, Imperial College is a great uh, environment to develop uh, skills for entrepreneurship. Um, uh, as engineers, we learn uh, important, uh, uh, we gather all the scientific knowledge so as to become uh, the best engineers because a company has uh, to have substance to develop something. So we based our company on developing uh, digital signal processing technologies that we were experts. Uh, we learned uh, uh, how to understand technology at the highest level and be able to utilize this technology in order to, re, uh, to solve industrial problems. That means that uh, uh, it helped us a lot in order to create business. Uh, through my PhD, I learned that uh, uh, success and breakthrough comes out of failures. So an important skill is not to fear failure because uh, if you are focused and uh, have a plan, failure is just a process. Um, and, uh, and through this uh, process, you develop uh, skills such as patience and uh, persistence, which is very important. Uh, and also self-confidence. Uh, this is what I would like to say to if the students that are hearing us uh, today, uh, only being uh, accepted to study at Imperial College is an achievement. And uh, this we should equip everyone with the uh, necessary self-confidence, which in combination with hard work, uh, uh, they can achieve a lot in their life. Hard work and persistence, absolutely. And Divya, same question to you. Um, so I think uh, a major skill that it possesses is uh, time management. We all have 24 hours in a day, but how smartly used it, uh, smart work versus hard work, like batching calls together and dedicating days to say, marketing or operations. 
secondly, I have high emotional intelligence, which really helps me understand the other person's point of view and in turn helps me negotiate better. And so I am a people's person, but I know how to get my work done without them getting to know it. So um, also if you're you know, a good negotiator, like negotiating well and then selling at a high price, then I think business is very simple. Just buy at a low price, sell at a high price. <laughs> Great so, advice for any any aspiring entrepreneur. Um, so I'm just going to ask one last question before we turn over to the Q and A. And so for those of you watching, please take an opportunity to put some questions into the Q and A. So Divya, I'm going to come straight back to you. I'm going to kind of flip it. Um, so knowing what you know now, what advice would you give to yourself when you graduated in 2013 or 2014? I think um, I would tell myself to read more and um, get a lot of knowledge in accounts and finance and start investing. The earlier you start, the better it is. And Tessa, same question to you. I think more or less the same. Uh, is, uh, if I had the opportunity to take some more education on entrepreneurship, uh, because back then I may seem a little bit old, but uh, when I was at uh, the Imperial College, there was no this there was no any culture of entrepreneurship or all, all these activities that you are now doing. So I would uh, try to find more uh, and uh, be educated at entrepreneurship and uh, finance because most of the things we found uh, and we learned the hard way <laughs> in the field. I think, I mean, I have, this, I have this great quote I read recently, which is entrepreneurship is a contact sport. And there is an element of it that you can do all of the reading you want to do, but fundamentally you have to get out there and, you know, and you kind of, it's it, you do it by practice. Uh, definitely. I need to read more of these books on the shelf. Um, so I haven't definitely haven't read all of those. Um, I'm going to go and see if we've got any questions. Um, and I've got one question here from Dr. Simi. Um, so I've run my business on the side for a few years, uh, but not had a proper business plan. Uh, I seem to have a fear for writing. Yeah, 100%. I absolutely can commune with that one. Um, so, but I'm writing one now to make sure I'm profitable. What are your top tips for writing a business plan? Or I guess like writing any kind of strategic plan that's about, right, I want to go from point A in over this time frame. By the end of the year, I want to get to point B. So... Divya, coming to you first, how, like, do you, did you write a business plan or how do you approach planning? Uh, yes, so I wrote a business plan and uh, from the very beginning to end, I uh, wrote all the steps and everything that would be required. And uh, I also sorted whatever would take time. I delegated that first, for example, registering the company, opening a background, simple things like this to more complex uh, things like setting up the business unit, looking for land, and uh, the faster things I implemented uh, side by side. So I delegated so that I could save on time. Um, but you have to think from start to end because no one else will think for you. And if you miss something, then that's missed. That's what I learned. Like what you do as uh, the founder is only going to happen in the company. Nobody else is going to do your role. Absolutely. And Tassos? Uh, my advice is to bring an expert. <laughs> uh, we have uh, uh, spin out uh, several companies. Uh, each one of these has it, its own business plan, uh, but it's a different market. It's a different, uh, there may be a different approach. Uh, so even though we know very well how to develop a business plan, we delegate. Uh, because... Uh, uh, bringing somebody that is expert in specific uh, domains in developing business plans for a specific uh, market, bring you also good insight and know-how uh, to go uh, to move forward. Follow-up question: Can you recommend a business plan expert? <laughs> I'm sure, Dr. Simi, you can connect with Tassos uh, uh, outside of this, and Tassos will recommend hundreds of business plan writing experts. Yeah. It's really interesting. But, but, but always keep the ownership, the vision, the plan, yeah. the, what you would like to get out of this business plan. So it's really interesting. So um, you mentioned Tassos that, like back in like the dark ages of the year two thousand, <laughs> there was nothing. There was, certainly, when I was at university, like the idea of doing entrepreneurship would have run a mile because it was all about business and it was all 
and it's only really from like the mid noughties that you start to see this like explosion of entrepreneurial support activities at lots of universities. But interestingly, my first ever job was running a business plan competition. And it used to be that entrepreneurship was all about writing business plans. Whereas now we don't, you know, everybody's too busy building minimum viable products and just iterating and being agile. But but planning is still an essential activity. You still have to be able to kind of strategically think about where you are now and where you want to, to get to. Um, I've got another question here. Um, oh, this is an interesting one. Perfectionism. So Divya, I'm going to give this one to you first. Sorry. Perfectionism is the enemy of progress. As successful entrepreneurs, or as a successful entrepreneur, do you agree with that statement? I, I strongly agree. I love this question because while launching, I faced this because uh, my partner was a perfectionist. So we took so much time in finalizing all the minor details, which I thought could be done very quickly. For example, the logo, the alignment of the website, the look and feel. Um, so when you're running after perfectionism, you spend too much time and you're losing out. I think um, the point should be to start small with whatever best you can. Obviously, don't compromise on quality, but keep improving with um, experience. And uh, every day lost uh, is sales lost. You know, one, one day delay is also sales lost. So you should manage, uh, find a balance between perfectionism and urgency. And then you're good to go. I think that's great advice. The um, it, it's interesting, isn't it? So the like the, the number of ideas that I've had that have been executed very successfully by other people, but you don't do them because you're like, well, I'm not quite ready, or it's not quite. So there isn't there is an element of you have to start something. You have to start somewhere. You can't wait for things to be perfect because they never will be. Tassel, same question to you. Uh, so do you agree with with that statement? Yeah. So perfectionism is the enemy of progress. Um. Uh... It depends on the definition of perfectionist. <laughs> uh, I, uh, um, uh, we are developing electronics. Uh, we are researching and we are developing electronics. And it's a, a constant discussion between the teams and the product managers. Uh, at what level uh, this uh, kind of tech our technology should uh, start entering the market? Because uh, the scientific people can uh, improve uh, the product uh, endlessly, and then you get out of market because <laughs> technology will sub will uh, um, uh, new technology will appear. Uh, so we are following the eighty twenty rule. Uh, so we are uh, developing a minimum value of product. We enter in the market, and then we are proving. So uh, it's. Uh, uh, we don't discuss about perfectionists, but we discuss about the high level of quality according to standards and quality control that we have internally. And I, I think that's really key. And we see that particularly with everybody, the, the sort of focus these days on like minimum viable product is that it, you still, even though it's minimum, it still has to do the job. It still has to be high quality. Um, and I think we, we see this a lot with that there's just an assumption, well, we just throw something up and that's all we need to do. Um, next question. Uh, oh, this is a good one. Uh, Divya, I'm going to come to you first. Have you ever had to deal with imposter syndrome during your journey? Um, I think the first day when I actually opened my office, uh, that was the only day when I uh, had several doubts and I was like, oh my God, now everyone knows about it. What if it doesn't work? <laughs> I won't get a second chance. But... Um, I, I was confident and I knew that I could create something great. Um, so I just went with the flow. Um, yeah, that's it. I think uh, you need to have belief in yourself. And um, I also, like my father once mentioned that when you're in business, oh, but they're on the floor every day. So you need to trust them. And, uh, uh, let them know that you're a student. So uh, when I know, don't know something, I tell them, okay, you know this better, you give me a solution. So there does not have to be any ego there, uh, be in a learner mode every time and uh, look at the greater aspects of how to grow the company and get sales. I, I love that. I love that kind of, uh, we, we talk about the, having the humility to learn. It's so important. Um, Tasso, so same to you. Have you ever had to deal with imposter syndrome? Actually, we are too busy to create any syndromes and too busy with so many challenges every day. 
uh, that we have to solve. So uh, uh, no time to create any syndromes. It's just uh, a matter <laughs> of hard work, uh, continuous uh, uh, developing, growing. Uh, so this is the everyday work of uh, uh, of uh, um, uh, an entrepreneur. And if you have uh, an excellent team that grows together with you, uh, just um, you just have your uh, feet on the ground and uh, continue uh, working and uh, growing the company. So we've got a question. So I, I think this probably is definitely, it says this is more towards Tassos, but then the question defines it as exclusively towards Tassos. So what are the main difficulties of setting up a new business in Cyprus? And if you know where I'm going to, you know how what I'm going to ask you when I come to you. Um, <laughs> so Tassos, you first, what are the main difficulties uh, of a new business in Cyprus? Uh, now it's, uh, it's an excellent place to come uh, and uh, create a business. We have a lovely weather, 25 degrees in uh, <laughs> December. The beach is only three minutes from oh. here. Uh, we have excellent internet, as you see, and uh, a very growing uh, startup community and a lot of high tech industries. Uh, so it, it was not the same in uh, 2024, uh, but uh, now is um, uh, one of the best uh, places in Europe to set up and grow a technology company. And we are attracted uh, uh, a lot of very big companies uh, recently in Cyprus. Anyone Brilliant, that w- fantastic sales pitch, <laughs> by the way. Of course. It sounds very wants- enticing from where I'm <laughs> sitting at the moment. Divya, so just to, just to, you know, what, what were the main difficulties of setting up a new business in sort of India in terms of like, what, what were there any things that you kind of were challenging or that you had to kind of work around? Um, so actually now, uh, situation in India is very pro-entrepreneurs. Um, yeah. Prime Minister has launched a startup policy, uh, and if you register yourself uh, in that, you get a lot of tax benefits, uh, you get loans also if you need, and uh, you can apply and get uh, patents and trademarks faster. Uh, so everything is very pro, and they're encouraging entrepreneurship right from schools. Um, so uh, there's no challenge as such now. I think it's only in our minds where, you know, how to go about it and uh, how to think big and still work with startup mentality not spending much money thinking of innovative ideas, but still uh, growing full out. I really, and, and I guess that goes back to what you were saying earlier, which I really liked, which is that sense of you can achieve an awful lot with not a large amount of money if you get really creative. Yes, yes, absolutely. Spot on. Um, so I'm just going to so whilst we get um, maybe a couple more questions in the Q&A, um, what would be your favourite piece of unconventional wisdom that you would get give to anybody starting out uh tassos (laughs) (laughs) have passion uh, and find satisfaction what you are doing uh being an entrepreneur is a very hard uh, job so you have to be dedicated and in order to be dedicated you have to have passion uh, and uh, you have to transfer this passion to your team because it's not a one man show; it's uh, a teamwork. I think I think that's so important. And um, I also I think there's a preconception that sort of enterprise entrepreneurship is it's just all about money. And, and ultimately, you know, if you're successful, it is. But I, certainly, one of the big lessons to me over the last five years at Imperial is is most of the people that we work with. Are driven by passion not by financial return and and just to that point it's that passion that keeps you going that that, that keeps you on what can be quite a like as i think but you've both alluded to a bit of a, a bit yeah. of an up and down journey divya so same question to you what's your sort of favorite piece of un, un, unconventional wisdom that you would give to anybody starting out um so one is uh what so has also said that uh, don't get stopped by money it's a means and not the end not the goal uh secondly i think uh one very thing uh one point that sticks to, uh, with me every time is that work not done plus reason is not equal to work done yeah so it's a simple equation where you can't give a reason to everything and just justify in your head that it's fine uh from for students like you know reaching late or not uh you know, st- sticking to your word, not being ethical. And we say, okay, there was traffic. No, you got up late, you started late. To, um, I couldn't do this because I didn't get money at that time. I didn't have 
funding at that time, so I couldn't achieve my goals. No, you didn't con uh, convince them or you didn't think of a better idea. So this uh, is valid everywhere. And uh, when you know the excuses, uh, just waste your time, then you'll actually be working. And I can see how you need to so say, how do you then balance that with like not be, because there's, there's the danger then you become too self-critical. That uh, everything is like, I wasn't good enough or I didn't, how do you, because, but I agree, you need that sense that you can't say, well, it didn't happen because of forces beyond my control. No, you were the person trying to do this. But how do you stop that from becoming a negative kind of, well, how do you stop yourself from just beating yourself up when things go badly? Like, uh, you don't have to beat yourself up, but learn from it and be disciplined. Just having a routine, being disciplined and maybe checking at the end of the week, you know, what I could have done better because you're learning every day. And yeah. You have to enjoy the process. Starting is easy, but then staying in it, uh, you know, having the desire to wake up every morning and working with passion. So you need to enjoy that journey. And having a co-founder really helps in that. Yeah, definitely, definitely agree with that. So I'm just going to go to one final question, unless we get any more. And this is um, so this is quite a specific question, but but I think there's a there's a, a more general question behind this. So, so the question is, so I'm revamping my vitamins business with light cell B2B. How do I get the attention of the stores and pharmacies? The question here really is, so it's hard, right? When you're starting out, how do you get, what are the tricks and tips that you, either of you can give around? How do you actually get that first call or that first meeting? It's like, it's like the cold start problem. You've got to start, but you've got to get that meeting. Divya, what, what, are, what are the kind of things that you've done to try and overcome to make it easier to kind of do that first deal or get the get those contacts that you really need to speak with do you have any kind of tactics or tips yeah uh, so i think you need to know how to use linkedin we are all are on linkedin but very few people know how to actually use it uh, so we use linkedin to connect with major retail stores and big hospital chains and we got bulk orders from them because that makes you you know uh, that it improves your cash flow uh, secondly always have a business coach i feel um, because there's no point reinventing the wheel uh, when people already know it, take from their wisdom and then build your own journey. Uh, so I'm associated with a couple of business communities and we have a network who have further contacts. So that speeds up the process. Fantastic. And Tassos, what would your response be there? Uh, first of all is to have substance, to have, uh, if you are in technology, to have uh, technology or to have a novel idea and be prepared, search, uh, see what are the competition, or what is your competitive advantage. So be very, very well prepared. And if you have this edge, certainly they will notice you. Uh, remember that uh, investors are receiving hundreds or thousands of uh, pitches, uh, the same uh, uh, institutions that they are funding startups. So you have to be very very well uh, prepared not only uh, and also very well prepared not only to show your technology and how good you are but also prepare about the environment about the competition mm. and know very well what you need this will draw the attention of somebody excellent advice and I've, I've had another really good question come in now and i think this is a great question for anybody who is passionate and committed uh, so there's been lots of work around you've got to be passionate you've got to be resilient you've got to keep pushing so question Divya are you able to switch off from work oh yes <laughs> Just, I, think I, yes. <laughs> I think I do my family thinks I don't because <laughs> it's always in your mind yeah. so how do, how do you how do you kind of because it must be it can be all consuming right so how do you keep that or, or have any kind of sense of work-life balance how do you try and keep things separate uh, so I have divided my time like when I wake up I have to work out so that is my me time then my office is half a day and my other half is kids and family friends um, and when I'm with them then I'm working on my phone or in my mind and thinking of uh, other things um, it's not on the laptop uh, but weekends I try um, to be with my family and not think about work um, but most of the you know disruptive ideas come on weekends somehow uh, so <laughs> I don't I think you're ever off it but uh, you make a list and just schedule those activities when you're with uh, say with, when I'm with my kids I'm only with them mm. when I'm at work I'm only at work so no mom gift and Tessa same question so obviously you know in amongst all of your various 
spin outs and ventures how do you how do you switch do you switch off from work actually i never thought about switching off uh, <laughs> because it's this is uh, this is my life so it's uh, uh i really enjoy what i'm doing so it's not work is not uh, uh like something uh, part or something uh, it's uh, very enjoyable actually and it's uh, uh, my hobby as well so I can uh, easily manage also family and hobby which is my work mm. so um, uh, if there is a need for private uh, time uh, we can uh, manage private time but uh, it, there is very very nice balance and if you really like what you are doing uh you can find the balance uh, in any case you spend more time with your colleagues and uh, uh, the company than your family it, it, so uh, i don't really thought of switching off uh also it's 24 the degrees outside the beach is down the road i don't think we have to worry about tussles yeah, of course. um you both mentioned that you started um business alongside co-founders so, so you think do you think it's a necessity to have a co-founder when starting a business, uh, Divya? Um, so I feel for girls, it does have an edge um, because um, no matter what we say, at least here, uh, we are still the primary caretakers of the house and the children. Um, so I feel it really helps you and uh, emotionally also when things are not uh, fine. So, you know, if even one is positive, then you sail through it. And having complementary skills definitely helps you make a better, more informed decision on any topic. So for me, it's an absolute necessity. Uh, it's more fun, you know. Mm. Uh, it's like a game then. And Tassos? Uh, as well for me, it was fun and peace still and uh, great. But uh, I've seen, uh, I, I have seen partnerships that uh, turn out to be disaster. So uh, it's a matter of the chemistry between people and sharing the same uh, passion. It's not a necessity, uh, but uh, uh, certainly it's uh, time sharing and effort sharing. And if uh, these two people have the same vision, uh, then it's something very good to have. Yeah, 100%. I mean, that's certainly, uh, we get this question a lot um, from kind of founders who've just starting out and they've got an idea, but they're worried about, starting up themselves or they hear everywhere that you know it's better to have a team it's better to have a diverse team with complementary sort of skill sets and that often could be that, that first barrier to people kind of taking the next step um i just got one final question uh this is more towards you divya i think um so can a good fashion brand stand out simply by having high quality products or or is it is it more about marketing and social media strategy? So what's what's your take on that question? So I feel that uh, you need to have high quality products. There's no doubt about it. Um, that is necessary, but that's not sufficient. Um, what you need is building a brand around it, telling your story. And that is what will make people connect with your brand, with your products, and they'll be willing to pay a certain amount. Otherwise, you'll be always going on sales especially in e-commerce and um, every other month there's a discount running which eats up your margins and um, through social media seo and uh, telling your story to the customers in innovative ways in videos and reels um, you create a brand and tell how good your product is and why because everybody will say the product is the best nobody says they have a bad product and in fashion every day new designers are coming out uh, but the story is the main difference and execution and getting to the people. And, and Tassos, I guess so you're more in a sort of technical sort of industry. Um, so do you, do you still think about sort of marketing and brand? Is that still a sort of fact of life in terms of like the, the businesses that you sort of are responsible for? Of course, definitely. A reputation is one of the key um, aspects of our success because you work so hard for so many years to build a reputation. And this is a money generating uh, uh, thing. So uh, maybe we don't have uh, a brand as in fashion, but certainly 
uh, the reputation uh, help us a lot in uh, returning clients and bringing new jobs uh, and new contacts. Mm. Fantastic. Well, look, it, thank you so much. It's been brilliant talking. Well, it's been brilliant firing questions at you. It would have been far harder if you'd been firing questions at me. Um, so really great to meet you both. Um, thank you so much for agreeing to take part in this interview. Uh, Divya and Tassos, it's been great to meet you. And hopefully I will. So Tassos, I might be coming to Cyprus next year. I'm definitely going to seek you out if I do. And Divya, India is definitely on the list too. So I would love to actually meet you in person. For those of you who've watched today's session, you can find out more about forthcoming events via the alumni events newsletter, or you can reach out to the alumni team directly. And hopefully look forward to seeing you at the next alumni spotlight event. Bye Thank for now. You.